I don't know how to start off this video other than by saying I almost didn't have a video. The very thing that I'm going to be, that I wanted to talk about today, I deleted it. <laughs> I ended up deleting the file and having to go back and do a text file recovery under Linux. Now, I've done it before. Thankfully, it's only once before. So I knew how, I knew the basics of how to do it, and I just had to go online to find out the details. So I got my text file back. Yay, got the program back that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, but that wasn't all. The next hurdle I had to go overcome was Open Broadcast Studio. And under Linux, it's, you know, it's still under beta, so it's not quite there yet. Uh, namely, the video settings, you know, the default for Open Broadcast Studio is a flash video. Even though it is recorded with X264, default container is FLV. And I was like, no. But under Windows, you have the options, some clicky, clicky options. You can get, you know, you don't have to deal with command lines. But, you know, I guess this is Linux, so screw us. We know what we're doing. So after I figured out exactly how to do that and get that all set up and taken care of, I called it a day. I was like, I'm, that's it. No more. So I come back today. Set up, you know, go to move the microphone, and in the process of doing that, I end up spilling a cup of coffee that I had. Well, after I got that mess cleaned up, the found out this the tracking on this was all messed up, and I thought it was the you know, maybe it was the batteries, and maybe there was coffee in there. Nope, and it was like well, when I went to use it on my pants, I guess my pants are magic because the mouse was working just fine on my pants. So then I'm trying to use a dish towel or a washcloth as a mouse pad, didn't quite work. And then I was like, okay, well, I have this mouse down here. This is a secondary mouse that I, from uh, Kingwin that I actually like. And it doesn't have the... Does it have the right... It doesn't... You know, it does. The scroll button can click left and right. And I liked it, but there was a problem of finding the uh, USB dongle for it. I was like, oh, well, maybe it's when one of the computers I have and you know, stored it away in the bedroom. It's like, maybe, you know, it's very tiny and hard to notice probably just left it in there sure enough i found one well get guess what it was a usb dongle all right it was to this thing so that solved the mystery of uh which usb dongle about six months ago that i accidentally swept up the vacuum cleaner and shaved hat in half ah uh, good times huh so then I had to go up into the attic and get one to see if I can have an old, see if I had an old mouse. Well, the problem there is that I'm going to be having back surgery in about 10 days. And yeah, it's not a good idea to be doing that. It's like, even if I did, wasn't in pain, it's like, there's that thing where I can't quite feel all the pain and I, I don't have all the feeling in my legs. So if I'm in pain, you know, if I'm in if my body's giving me excruciating pain to try to tell me to stop doing something, I'm not going to feel that. I'm just going to keep going because the pain's going to be dulled. So virtual machines, when you're a, as a home user, you have there's three common options. There's VMware, there's VirtualBox, and there's QMU. Uh, Vir VMware, not too many people have played around with that because for the longest time there really wasn't a version for home users you had to pay a license to get it even even though you know it, it was available on linux that does of course that doesn't mean it's free it was a paid product and it wasn't until sometime recently that vmware came up with a free version and it wasn't until about 2009 that the free version could create its own virtual disk images the more common option most people use is virtual box um, that one is, it, the products are pretty much similar. Um, you know, graphical user client, same as VMware. Um, the uh, third option is QMU and that's all command line driven. And a lot of people kind of back off. It's like, nah, it's not for me. And they'll go with the easier GUI clients. Now, the problem that I have with the GUI clients is they are focused on treating the whole thing as like per as a one whole computer. It's like you set up like a, a, a bot, you set up a virtual machine for Arch Linux. Well, that's one computer. If you set up one for Ubuntu, well, that's one computer. If you set up one for OpenSUSE, that's one computer. You see where I'm going with this? If you set up one for yeah, you know, set up a virtual machine for for Windows, that's one computer. 
So when you start dealing with all the, you know, we, I have like 30 virtual machines or 30 disk images anyway. And I wanted a way to, you know, keep things the same. Now, I, like I said, I didn't deal with VMware too much. Just didn't, it just rubbed me the wrong way. But I, I did start scripting the virtual box, the virtual box manager, which is the command line interface to virtual box. My, like, I, but the only problem there is once again, uh, treating everything as one computer and then you having to have, you know, like load up the one computer and then it, the script would attach a disk image and then start up the virtual machine and then turn off the virtual machine and then take out the disk image. And I, that was kind of clunky. And what was even clunkier is how VirtualBox handled doing disk partitions. When you start getting into, you know, big time, vir you know, virtual machines or not big time virtual machines, but when you start, you know, really getting into it and you want to get start getting more performance, you find out about using a disk partition and just handing that off to the virtual machine. Well, VirtualBox is very, very weird, almost to the point of being stupid when it comes to using disk partitions. So that's when I started going over to QMU. And over the course of time, I had built up a you know, script to use QMU and I had a base, you know, I had my base and I could, you know, my you know, everything that I would change would become a command line parameter to the script. So I just kept building the script up over time and eventually it got to the point where I was having a little bit of difficulty remembering all the stuff that I wanted to do. It's like, I knew I could do it. Just, you know, couldn't remember how, you know, what letter you know, was the command line option. So that's when I started getting is like, I, started getting the idea to write a GUI for the command line script. And now I've had, I do have programming background. I do have a programming background and it's been so long. This is how long it's been. And this is when I, this is a, <laughs> when I got into programming and I started learning programming, Windows NT Server 4.0 was a thing. And Jesus Christ, somebody needed to, look at that font that they used in this book. Somebody needed to be shot for this. But I was looking through this and, uh, dear God, like there's Internet Explorer. The crux of many people's frustrations for the coming years. And there was actually things in here. It's like, I didn't know Windows NT 4.0 had the, uh, the thing with the disks, the, uh, it wasn't logical disk manager under NT 4.0. I think it disk administrator, it was disk administrator. I don't know if the format, you know, for doing dynamic disks, you know, if it was called something different, whatnot, but the concept was there in Windows NT 4.0. And there was also something in here I wanted to show and I, don't think I'm going to be able to find it. I'm probably just going to end up having to move on. There was an interface that is long gone in here. And I was like, oh, man, I remember when we used to do that, that kind of GUI implementation where you had Windows inside of Windows. We don't do that anymore. And I thought that was just going to be a thing. That I was like, oh, they'll come back to it. And they never did. So, but this here is something that really screwed me up. Now, C++ in itself, eh, eh, I could deal with it. But the problem that I had in this, in this class was the blatant uh, handling, or it was just like the, the blatant casual approach to classes and object oriented programming that really got me and I failed this course. I failed. I was already like, kind of like struggling. I probably would have like, if you would have cut out the object oriented portion of this class, I would have got a C probably, but here, uh, this entire book 
this is what's dedicated to classes. And at that point, I just want to smack somebody up alongside the head because for years, if you have done functional and procedural programming, that is not a decent amount of coverage to get a grasp on what object-oriented programming is. And that's why I failed this course. That and this really isn't a textbook. This is, you know, a computer book that you would buy, you know, well, now you would buy it at Amazon, but then like Walden Books, Barnes and Noble. So here, now when I got to this class, which was right after the C class, classes all of a sudden made sense and it pissed me off that i couldn't just like oh i know this let me go back and no couldn't do that but that's amazing when you have a programming language that is designed from the ground up to be object oriented how much more sense it made imagine that and of course i remember the joke about in school about this book was you could read this book cover to cover and still not be able to write a decent java program so, here is where things are going to get a little controversial. And that is Visual Basic. I still maintain that the Visual Basic 5 with its IDE was the gold standard. And that's where people just turn off the video and say, I'm fucking nuts. Uh, no, I'm not nuts. If you are of the mind where there's a time and place for object-oriented programming and there's a time and a place for, you know, functional and procedural programming, Visual Basic 5 followed that. And it was awesome. And you had all the help that you can get. You could, as you were typing out, it's like you typed out the name of your, con you know, whatever you were referencing from, you know, whatever control in there. And it's like, boom, there was a list. And that was awesome. And they screwed it up in Visual Basic 6. And I'm sure they kept screwing it up and screwing it up. But that's why I say Visual Basic 5 was the gold standard. I'm not saying Visual Basic itself is the gold standard, but 5 was a gold standard. So I don't know what to say. Uh, people have a very big misconception on what, what Visual Basic can accomplish. And it's like, oh, it's yeah. yes, it just like PHP, you can have amateurs throw together pretty uh, intense code and then completely get it wrong and lead to big security holes and whatnot. I don't know. I don't think Visual Basic would allow you to get to the uh, security holes because there was you had to deal with a lot of checks that the process you know that the code processing environment i don't know what the technical term is i can't remember anymore but uh yeah there'd be something that'd go in and check your array bounds so that you weren't going out of line you know going into you know memory that you weren't assigned but with visual basic i was using this book a lot and there was stuff that i could do in Visual Basic, and it's like, you know, people, you know, with their C++ and their other programming environments, I was doing it in Visual Basic too, so here we go. Trying to get a Windows, you know, for somebody that got their start in programming on the Windows side to do programming on the Linux side. Now, of course, I wanted a you know, rapid application development environment. And I, that's when I landed on WX Form Builder. And I was like, oh, goody, WX Form Builder, Python. I know Python. Yay, let's go in there. And that's when the first problem came up. Uh, it turns out the absolute positioning, well, yes, is a bad thing to do. But I don't think the sizer thing. First of all, don't force somebody to do something if they don't want to do it. I would be a lot better with the absolute positioning. Now, I know the arguments against absolute positioning. Visual Basic had a very good compromise for this. Uh, by default, yes, everything was positioned according to pixels, but I believe that was points that you could you can change the metric over to points or something 
to that effect so that when somebody loaded up your application in like you know 144 dpi or 196 or 192 dpi it wouldn't look like crap and that was how visual yeah that's how it was done in visual basic now i don't get why we use sizers but it's like okay i'm gonna have to play along aren't i all right so kick my ass <laughs> tell you the truth kick my ass for a little bit and i finally got it and then the next thing came up and it's like when i generated you know i had my form and it's like oh i gotta deal with classes again because this entire form is going to be a class that i have to import and then override you know it's like oh i can call fun you know i can have these controls call functions when they're clicked but the form ain't going to do that the form's going to tell me to import import this code and create a class and override the i'm going to create these virtual uh functions for you and you have to override them oh thank you thank you because that's exactly what i wanted to do i i do not like object oriented programming a lot of the stuff that i do is not now if you're like programming something like LibreOffice or open broadcast studio or open shot okay if you want if you want to say hey you know it's so much easier when i use object oriented programming i believe you and if i was doing it myself well i'd probably shoot myself in the head but if yeah, if i was helping out anyway it's like yeah i'd expect object oriented programming there but when you're talking about a simple little you know gooey client just to interact with a script and you already know it's you know, very simple stuff there is no reason to go into object-oriented programming sorry that's just the way it is so having said all of that I'm gonna show you what the program looks like okay that introduction sucked but moving on Gonna launch the program here and move this window off a little bit to the side and there we go now you'll notice that I didn't have to type anything in all the settings that I used before are presented to me you know that when I launched this program uh, let's just take it one step at a time here go to the very first one the terminal um, I recommend doing that because that gives you access to the QMU launcher or console and let's see let me type my password here and there you go here comes arch linux booting up and you notice you know i am using 720p and that's not quite big enough for the window but that's fine for demonstration purposes now i don't have it thanks to the access to the console i don't have to touch the virtual machine to turn it off oh unless you don't remember the exact command there we go now, if you don't want to use the terminal, that's fine. God bless you. You know, it may be, you know, you're not into that kind of stuff. So, uh, one of the initial problems I had with the QCL script is like I was, you know, I was always using it at a terminal and relying on sudo. Well, if you don't want to use a terminal, I can't rely on sudo. So, the QGL program will then instead call PK exec. And there we go. Of course, now since we didn't want to use the terminal, I don't have access to the QMU console, so I gotta log in. And issue the power off command. And there we go. Now, and you notice, you know, if my demonstration has uh, encouraged you to start using the terminal boom hey I didn't have to type it back in uh, and you'll notice that um, that's pretty much true you know the reason behind all this down below um, you know if you want to you need a secondary hard drive you know something you know, like here I'm using it uh, secondary hard drive for some of my virtual machines for compiling a custom Linux kernel because the box DMR DRM kernel module is awesome and and makes VNC a whole heck of a lot nicer. You're not stuck to these really uh, 
And well, there's a terse list of uh, re resolutions that you're stuck if you do at if you do not use the box DRM kernel. So, you know, before um, Ubuntu and OpenSUSE and other distributions. I just you know, pop in this other hard drive and I compile the kernel under that operating system and boom, now I have the box DRM kernel module. Uh, another th uh, thing that is, it, it, another nicety that is enabled by this program is I have the uh, Arch Linux ISO loaded up here. And if I screw something up in one of the VMs and I can boot off this, but I don't have to keep searching for the file every time that I want to use it to diagnose what's wrong with the VM. And same thing here, like the secondary ROM has the vert IO driver image or ROM image for Windows. I don't want to have to keep searching for that. So I just enable and disable as I need it. Now, for Linux VMs, if you, you know, really screwed something up and maybe a shrewd is only your only option, is just to check away and boom. And I'm going to type in my password here. And you'll notice now I am shrouded into that disk image and I can, you know, if I messed up a configuration file in Etsy somewhere, then I can go in and edit it and get back out and hopefully everything will be fine again. Uh, some of the other options you will notice here, uh, by default, QCL is going to call QEMU and use a tablet. Device. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. What are you going to do? I guess I haven't had that much great luck at all. Uh, so the tablet device is not supported by every operating system. So if you're using a GUI environment and you want a mouse pointer, you're going to have to use USB. Uh, with the tablet device, wherever your mouse cursor is over the guest is you know where the guest is going to think that the mouse cursor is at. Uh, USB mouse, the tracking gets a little bit off and... A little bit and it's a little bit weird when you got two cursors and one of them is off so hey some mouse is better than no mouse if you're using a GUI uh, IDE some you know operating systems aren't going to support vert IO there's no vert IO drivers for them other operating systems like uh, Windows XP you're gonna maybe you don't have the uh, floppy disk driver so but you can still go ahead and, and install Windows XP with IDE hard disks and then when you're done and you get time and when you get to the point where you're going to install these the vert io drivers you can check this box down here and that's going to give you one ide disk and one vert io disk because you can uh, install the drivers all you want but if there's no device that uses that driver then windows is never going to load it so once you have you know one ide and one vert io and the driver gets loaded you can turn on you know reboot windows xp without the IDE hard disks and boom, you're going to get uh, vert IO and windows XP. Uh, think ver uh, memory. That's pretty much self-explanatory. The X 11 listening port, you know, uh, QCL is going to call if you're using VNC, then it's going to uh, call QEMU and then it's going to specify that, you know, start VNC with the, on um, and use the, uh, port 50 for the listening port. You can change that port if you want. Uh, QXL is pretty much similar, except you add 6,000 to the number and that gives you the TCP port. So I think I got everything covered there and sorry for, uh, dropping the mic on you guys. Uh, but it, like I said, this is uh, loaded up on GitHub right now. If you want to go ahead and check this out, be my guest, you know, file bug reports. If you find a bug, if you, uh, think of something that I didn't think of, then, you know, there's, you can file an issue for a, uh, for an upgrade or for a new feature. And, you know, I hope, I hope you like it. I hope you check it out. And, you know, one of the first bugs that I know that, uh, I need to fix is, uh, the script still uses, uh, two cores. Uh, you may not, or may not have enough cores in your system to handle that. Uh, I think I should go in there and yeah, maybe I should go on here and do that now. So, hope you enjoy the program. Thanks and good night.